Hello, welcome back to English Law. So I'm carrying on about um, uh, liability and uh, there's also the proximity test. I was speaking about Donahue and Stevenson last time. Uh, so remember, if there's going to be some liability, uh, there's got to be foresight. The harm must be reasonably foreseeable. And uh, Lord Atkin was the uh, leading judge on this case. So he underscored the necessity of a relationship of proximity between the poor parties in such an action. But this doesn't mean that they need to be geographically near to each other. So proximity means that um, in that situation there's some sort of duty of care because there's some connection between them that's not too tenuous. Uh, all right, so um, there's a well-known case, it's called Sudraha um, against NERC 2006, which went to the House of Lords in the days when that was the UK Supreme Court. So um, uh, there was a guy who was living in a village in Bangladesh. He was one of many people who drank some water that was uh, contaminated with arsenic. And he said that the defendant had caused or at least materially contributed to him falling sick um, because the person had not drawn attention to the, um, to the arsenic in the water when he made a report which claimed the water was potable. Uh, the defendants um, had been uh, granted a contract by the Overseas Development Agency to test the water for minerals and to see whether these would be injurious to um, uh, what is called an ichthyne life. Um, anyway, they were not supposed to regard whether it was suitable for humans, whether there was any arsenic in it. So um, the defendants said there was no case here, there was no proximity between them and the entire population of Bangladesh, therefore they could not be found liable. The House of Lords they um, concurred with the Court of Appeal decision and they held that there was no proximity between the claimants and the defendant, so therefore there was no duty to verify that the water was free for, from arsenic and therefore um, fit for human consumption. This is what Lord um, um, Hoffman said. The principle is not that a duty of care is owed in all cases in which it's foreseeable, the absence of care, someone may suffer physical injury. There must be proximity in the sense that a measure of control over the responsibility for the potentially dangerous situation. Such a principle does not help the claimant. The defendant um, had no control whatever in law and practice over the supply of drinking water in Bangladesh, nor was there any statute, contract or other arrangement which imposed on it responsibility for ensuring that it was safe to drink. So the um, uh, proving a duty of care is the first thing you need to do if you're claiming negligence. The issue is often argued as the first issue before they look at other things about the case, and that is um, a very utile way to um, uh, get rid of um, feeble claims, just vexatious. Um, what, and Lord Hoffman went on to observe, when one considers the scale and cost of the trial, the case for stopping the proceedings now appears to me to be overwhelming. Now, there's another very influential case here, which is Anne's against the London Borough of Merton. Now, this is about the legal principle and policy, how they intersect. So I've looked at the first two um, aspects of the duty test. So how um, about the test about whether it's fair, just and reasonable? So this three-stage test, for the duty of care. And the House of Lords used this in Caparo Industries, PLC, against Dickman, 1990. The Caparo test is vital. Um, okay. Um, in the 70s, judges were usually satisfied to decide whether there was a duty of care and damage and to be reasonably foreseeable, and then that there was proximity, yeah, the person was liable. In 1970, Lord Reed, in a vital case called Home Office Against Dorset Yacht Company Limited, um, said that all negligence actions and duty, whether that was that was in question, they, they would presume that the Atkin test was applicable and that would be enough to settle the issue of duty or no or no duty. However, as the 70s wore on, people began to think that the um, Atkins test was no longer entirely satisfactory. Uh, why were there such concerns over the restrictions to the Atkin formula? It's because they began to realise that defendants were, sorry, claimants were suffering damage of a kind which um, broached more complex um, issues. Um, these weren't necessarily a blatant traumatic uh, injury and the injury could be, could be sustained due to careless behaviour. So this um, duty test was uh, established. Economic losses arising from negligent acts or negligent misstatements were very, um, how to put it, like indeterminate, um, particularly, particularly tricky to decide. They're problematic, um, and they thought that the two notions of foresight and proximity were not enough bearing that such losses were mounting, and they wanted the duty test to um, serve its purpose of restricting li 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 um, liability for um, 
uh, injury or loss which arose from negligence. So it was like the, the, the danger of loss or the kind of injury that the tort system um, did not want to compensate um, would pass the foresight and proximity test. Right, a different component that they then um, super added to the Atkins test was to permit the notion of duty to carry on um, as a way of restricting liability. Lord Wilberforce, he was the judge sitting on Anne's against Merton London Borough Council in 1978 when that went to the appellate court. Although, incidentally, this course, this is no longer had to be a valid law, the, the findings in that case. So he thought he would introduce an element which was heretofore or theretofore missing. So this is what Lord Wilberforce had to say. The duty question has to be approached in two stages. First, one has to ask whether the alleged wrongdoer, the person who suffered the damage, there is a sufficient relationship of proximity of neighbourhood such that, in the reasonable contemplation of the former, carelessness on his part would be likely to cause damage to the latter in which case a prima facie duty of care arises. Secondly, if the first question is answered affirmatively, it is necessary to consider there any other considerations which ought to negative or reduce or limit the scope of duty or a class of person to whom it is owed and the damages to which a breach may give rise. Close quotation. So um, stage one in Anne's uh, it includes Atkins' neighbour principle. The second part is about policy factors um, which may vitiate, um, uh, reduce or restrict any duty and the, the policy reasons for these. So there is an um, uh, obvious distinction in Lord Wilford's test between the legal principle and the policy because the, um, in this test the legal principle decides whether there's a duty of care or not, that's the first limb, and the second limb is about policy, which might um, then work to uh, reduce or exclude altogether the duty. Now Lord Wilberforce's um, test has come under fire from scholars of jurisprudence and other jury consults. So the ANS test <clears throat> has been castigated um, particularly because it tries to separate um, principle and policy. Some people say that this separation will lead to wrongful and unjust decisions. It's made the law more unclear over the issue of and the function of the duty concept, so many judges say we shouldn't muddy the waters there. So reasoned from that perspective, the uh, function of duty of care is hard to say if policy did not inform itself about the duty issue. So if we um, accept that the uh, purpose of the duty of care is to restrict liability for reasons of policy, then um, it must automatically follow that the duty of concept is made up mainly of policy components. So whereas the Lord of Wilberforce test would suggest that it's not. Now, the first negative repercussion of the separating the principle and policy is that policy was not um, clearly um, engaged in uh, a judge's um, uh, rulings and that the test separates policy um, components from the matter of whether duty is found or not. So judges then, as today, um, are aware of how vital policy considerations are to all aspects of the duty test, but, uh, and, and that's against uh, Lord Wilberforce's formulation. So it was thought that um, policy factors are there to decide whether there's a duty or not. And there's no issue, uh, if there's no issue of the, of the duty arising at all, then policy factors um, very much imply that the case in front of the court is not one in which you can um, justify um, spreading or shifting the claimant's loss onto anyone else. Now, this second um, harmful uh, uh, consequence that was thought to have come from Lord Wilberforce um, distinguishing separation, distinguishing you know policy and principle is that Lord Wilberforce, uh, his um, approach to the duty issue um, was thought that, uh, to make liability um, too broad in sort of, instead of restricting liability. So in summary, um, what it did was the exact opposite of what he um, intended to do. The newer negligence claims are, are often litigated successfully. Um, although um, in the time when ANS was still held to be valid law, it was authoritative, liability and tort did not broaden towards solely economic loss inflicted through negligence. After the ANS case was overruled by Murphy in 1990, liability for negligently causing pure economic loss has been um, uh, seriously restricted. So it is vital to underscore that the second limb of the Wilberforce test um, in quintessence means that the conceptual or instance of fair, just and reasonable criteria are there. They, they um, introduce a more, um, well, just a pellucid engagement with the policy factors um, when you're judging 
on this issue of duty of care. So how about fair, just and reasonable as per Caparo? So the main response to this um, a period of um, ever expanding liability after the Anne's decision um, meant that judges in the late 80s into the 90s were increasingly uh, dubious about the issue that uh, Lord, Ask, uh, Lord Atkin put in Donoghue and Stevenson. Remember that Lord Atkin was trying to find a general conception of relations giving rise to a duty of care of which the particular cases found in books are but instances. That's exactly what uh, Lord Atkin said. So Caparo Industries Public Limited Company against Dickman 1990. So this is an appellate court ruling. And that's a case that I'm going to um, delve into in greater depth in, in a subsequent video. So it's about negligent misstatement. But it's uh, vital to um, look at this because it lays down what was a, a tripartite test. And this is a rather broad ratio in Caparo. This is what Lord Bridge said. In addition to the foreseeability of damage, necessary agreements in any situation giving rise to a duty of care are there that should exist between the party owing the duty and the party to whom a relationship characterised by law as one of proximity or neighbourhood. And that situation should be one in which the court considers it fair, just and reasonable that the law should impose a duty of a given scope upon the one party for the benefit of the other. Close quotation. Incidentally, proximity and reasonable, these are synonyms in tort law. Um, so we have to ask why Lord Bridge thought that principles such as foresight, proximity and so on, even though they are important in um, uh, evolving the law of negligence, were no longer to be depended upon in these new duty situations. So this is what he said and something that other judges have applauded in, in other cases. Um, these terms, and this is a quotation, are not susceptible of any precise definition, as would be necessary to give them utility as practical tests, but amount in effect a little more than convenient labels to attach to the features of specific situations, which, on detailed examination of all the circumstances, the law recognises pragmatically giving rise to a duty of care um, given scope. Um, all right, so let me um, remind you what the Caparo test is. Um, here's a precy. So, so, so the three stages to it. One, there's foreseeable harm to the claimant. Two, there is neighbourhood or proximity between the parties. And three, that it's fair, just and reasonable for there to be a duty in the circumstances. Um, now you see what you need to do is to apply this um, uh, tripartite test. Um, the duty of care hasn't um, previously been found in um, uh, a similar set of facts. That's enough at the moment. Toodaloo.